Hi, this is Guy Wallace, just having a little fun with the notion of job aids, which were known back in the 1960s and 70s as guidance by Rummler and Gilbert and their legion of followers. Later on, they were known as job aids by Joe Harless, and I believe that started in the 70s and 80s, but I'm not really sure. And today, job aids is a prevalent term in the learning and development, training and development, instructional design business. But some have to mess around with the labels we use in the instructional training and learning space, as one example. And it's been that way since I joined back in 1979. Uh, these are also known as Electronic Performance Support Systems, EPSS, when they're embedded in the tools, the software that people use in their workflow. Um, they're also known as Quick Reference Guides, uh, SOPs, standard operating procedures, which are usually highly regulated, also fall into this camp. They guide performance. They are job aids, uh, but they're just a little bit different. And now the term performance support has come about and even the term, the phrase workflow learning. I take exception to this last one here because it's not always about learning. Sometimes we use job aids uh, for guidance and support to avoid learning because we can't expect people to memorize everything that might be necessary for them to perform. So performance guidance, job aids, performance support, all these terms are really all about performance. And your job aids for guidance and support will only be as good as your performance analysis methods. That's important. We won't be covering that today. But we learned decades ago not to expect people to be able to memorize complex performance. It's too risky. When the performance stakes are high, with high risks and or high rewards, we should choose to enable performance without requiring memorization. We should enable performance by providing job aids and they'll let the performer know it's then okay to simply forget about it. The way I was taught to look at this back in 1979 is that our first option should be standalone job aids or performance support. Option two might be performance support embedded in training because we need to make sure that people know how to use the job aid, the performance support items. The third option for us in the instructional realm is training when we need memorization and or honing skills. And a fourth option, of course, has always been do nothing and simply leave it to informal means. That's important. Now, a great definition of job aids came from Joe Harless. It's simply a mechanism that stores information outside the individual performer, simply guiding the performance. And it's got to be easily accessed to be used in real time. It needs to signal the performer when to start the performance. It needs to provide sufficient direction and details on how to perform each task each and every time. Um, this reduces the amount of memorization for recall purposes that's required. I like using three categories uh, that Rummler and Gilbert use. They call the categories the directory, the ensampler, and the query. Now there are definitions for what the subtypes under these three categories. It's a little bit different. It's evolved over time. So I'm going to go through a mix uh, from uh, various sources, which I'll credit at the end of this. The directory is the most familiar, as this says. Uh, it provides step-by-step. -step. It could be a checklist, worksheets, etc. The ensampler is, provides examples, you know, so worked examples would fit right in here. And the query is something that's uh, a little bit different, but when the situation is complex, we can use ways to, if you will, Socratically guide performance by posing a series of questions that people answer and then there's a logical conclusion when they're all done with that. So the directory includes cookbooks, step action tables, step-by-step -step guides. And we can do this through today smartphones and tablets and desktops. We can embed it in other kinds of software and tools that people use to get the job done. These could simply be audio guides or visual video guides or posters. 
There's also the worksheet and forms. When you go visit a loan officer and they're collecting information, they're filling out a job aid, basically capturing the correct information. It may guide them as how to do certain uh, uh, math problems associated with that, uh, your income and your expenses and you know what your ability is to repay the loan. Checklists are used when you need to Provide some guidance that either is in sequence or not in sequence or a mix. Sometimes you need to follow, do the first three steps in sequence, the next five in any order that you want, the last two after those five in the middle have been completed. There's algorithms and decision tables. Uh, they give us a bunch of if-then statements and then you logically lead yourself through your answers to the final conclusion. There's uh, flow charts that are just the same, except they're highly visual, and we've all seen those where there's a, a, a series of questions and a yes or no is the answer, usually not always, and that'll guide you to the next question. And again, Socratically, it takes you through a decision-making process. The ensamblers, again, are work examples, so we can provide you know, good examples, and in fact, in the old days, we called them bad examples, but I guess 20 years ago or so, we started changing them to be non-examples. The query, the example that Rummler and Gilbert gave in their September and October 1970 newsletter talked about a paper computer. Of course, this was back in 1970, and while there were computers, not everybody had one, and so there was a way for people to go through and answer questions, filling in a little set of circles with their choice. It's almost like a multiple choice exam, where you, and when you lift the final page, you see how you've marked this up, and you can conclude, oh, my answer kind of leans this way versus that way, and so that guides me the answer. Uh, the example they used is a, uh, uh, how uh, salespeople sold magazine advertisements and they gave this paper computer to the customer and let the customer do this themselves. So it was kind of a consultative selling approach using paper computers via what Rumbler and Gilbert called guidance. Now we want to use job aids for performance guidance support when the risks are high, the rewards are high. When the performance is complicated and we can't expect people to memorize everything because that's quite problematic, we need to provide them with guidance. If the performance is infrequent and we've taught somebody and they could prove that they could do it in the classroom or in e-learning, we can't expect them to memorize something that they use infrequently. Every six months or more randomly uh, is problematic and we need to provide that kind of guidance. If the job aid or performance support or guidance would inhibit or interfere with the job, we shouldn't use it, okay? And if the performance is likely to change and you don't want the performers to even memorize the tasks, you want them to basically do the performance tasks, produce the outputs, and then forget about it. Sometimes we do use job aids to facilitate learning, memorization of both the physical and cognitive behaviors that people need to employ when they're doing their work. But other times we want to avoid that again because it's complicated and we can't expect them to really do it. It's infrequently performed. Um, so we can't expect them to memorize that and keep that in working memory long enough for them to actually do it. Um, and there's times when we don't want them to memorize it because the performance might change, the requirements might change, and we don't want somebody to be memorizing something and doing last month's performance perfectly, but it's no good today because the procedures have changed. So again, option one, standalone job aids or performance support. Option two, embed that stuff in training. This is often helpful when your client resists the notion of using job aids and so you simply give them the training that they requested and embed the performance support items into the training and uh, make that available as takeaways so that they can go back and use it back on the job. But there are times when we want training for memorization or we need to hone skills. If we gave a salesperson a job aid, a checklist of what to do in a sales call, that may not be sufficient. And if the rewards are high, the risks are high, 
for failure in a sales opportunity, then we may want to make sure that people actually have that committed to memory. And if it's something that they're going to be doing a lot, then that will begin to reinforce the performance and they can skip the job days. But it might be a crutch initially. And you, and so, there, but there's times when that crutch, that job aid is inappropriate to be used, for example, during a sales call. We expect our emergency medical technicians to have things memorized at the ready for when the need comes up. And we don't expect them to be referring to some performance guidance in an emergency. And of course, the fourth option again is to do nothing and leave it to informal means because it is low-hanging fruit, otherwise known as low-stakes performance, low-risk, low-rewards. Performance competence is the ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to the stakeholder requirements. Your performance support will only be as good as your performance analysis your ability to determine what are the tasks, what are the outputs, and what are the stakeholder requirements for both. To help you with this, I've produced a little white paper. It's not exactly a job aid, uh, or is it? Here are some of the reference that I've used over the years. Some of these things I've had in my metal file cabinets since the mid-80s. Thank you.